Help us to hear your voice. Help us to hear you speaking. We might hear the words and the news and the challenge you have this day. We pray in your Son's name. Amen. A colleague of mine had it right. In reading the Gospel this morning, it feels like John the Baptist has come to ruin our Christmases. Because here is that text that we read every single year in the midst of this season of joy and goodwill, of carols and lights, of tinsels and cookies, even on this morning that we dedicated to fellowship time and crafts, we hear John the Baptist and his message that is not exactly hopeful. Not exactly what we expect and want to hear is our Christmas time gospel. Repent, he says, for I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me, and I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear the threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Oh, and Merry Christmas. It's a jarring <laughs> conjunction, these words of John with the cheery, happy holiday atmosphere that pervades in December, that in fact we take great pains to put in place in December. It's jarring, yet it's also important. Because as we pastors sometimes overly remind people, we're not yet at Christmas in the church. The Society around us is already playing Rudolph and Frosty and Santa Claus is coming to town, but we are still preparing and looking ahead to what is going to come. We're an advent. Time to prepare to examine ourselves, our lives, and our faith. Prepare to hear once again about the one who came in Bethlehem and whose kingdom is not yet fulfilled and for Advent, for that time of preparation, this text is actually rather perfect. John invites the audience to repent, to turn, to come back to God. And it's important to note that this call to repentance is not, would not have played the same in John's time as it does in our own. This was not a call for people to repent of their horrible, awful sins, you decrepit, unredeemable worms, go back to God who wants to save you because they didn't have that concept. The idea of individual sins was in many ways still in its formation stages, and the idea that there was a salvation was certainly not well formed. There was a sense that individuals had things to do, but it wasn't what we think of when we think of sin in 21st century Christianity. It was something slightly less. And I can't give a good definition because it was still being defined. But what John means when he says repent is not you decrepit worms, you're sinful and unworthy, but instead Hey, you people of Yahweh, you need to reform your lives to be in Yahweh's alignment. John wasn't calling people to feel bad about themselves, but to examine themselves. To say, here's how Yahweh, how God calls for us to be living, and here's how I'm living, and I need those two to match, and they don't. So let's work to do so. John was expecting some sort of event, some sort of God event to occur, an inbreaking of the divine. And he was coming to his community, to his people, asking them to restart who they were, to be transformed. It's no mistake, he goes to the Jordan, the place where the Israelite people crossed over before they came to the promised land. Because 
John wanted his people to once again start over with Yahweh, with God, to be ready for the big event that John was certain was coming. For John, this repentance was less about individual sins and more about aligning themselves with God. Repent. John seems to say, check yourselves, transform yourselves, and bear fruit that shows your transformation is real, fruit that declares you are walking with Yahweh because something is coming, something grand and glorious, the kingdom of heaven. And unless you're lined up with Yahweh, you're going to miss it. You won't be ready. As Christians, we believe that this something was indeed a radical transformation, for it was Jesus. Jesus, who called upon his people to love their enemies and pray for them to persecute them, to care for the least of these. Jesus, who preached the Sermon on the Mount, where he said to be salt, to not give in to anger, to not lust, to turn the other cheek, to give your coat away, to be mindful of the poor, and to see everyone as a brother or a sister you're called to love. Jesus indeed invites us into a new way of living, invites us to see how God teaches us and to realign ourselves with God in a way that both reaffirms the Jewish teachings of his day and stretches them, in a way that both reaffirms the conventional wisdom of what being a good person is like today and stretches them. And at least how we as Christians read John's message, that's what John is preparing us for, what Advent is preparing us for. For the radical transformation that comes with Jesus Christ, the reordering of our lives and the ways of God that Jesus will preach and teach and call us into. And that requires some repentance. But John, in his message, doesn't stop at just saying repent. He talks about consequences. We don't very often hear we don't talk about the wrath of God. We don't talk about what God's judgment looks like. There are several reasons for that. One, I just don't think I have the personality to be a fire brimstone preacher. I don't think I would like it. I couldn't do it. And two, I do not believe that our God is primarily a God of judgment. I think God is much more about grace and forgiveness and multiple chances to transform. But it's easy sometimes to forget that eventually God expects us to get to work. That the God of love and grace that I preach about in most of my sermons is still a God that expects us to do the work of justice righteousness and shalom. A God who hates injustice and who hates apathy toward those in need and mistreatment toward those who are most vulnerable. The God who our faith teaches us about, who I try to preach about, and who John certainly preached about, is a God who is not afraid at long last to take action for the sake of the kingdom. And John's image of this is powerful and, frankly, almost terrifying. John says, The axe is at the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and tossed into the fire. The shovel he uses to sift the wheat from the husk is in his hands. He will clean out his threshing area and bring the wheat into his barn and burn the husks with a fire that can't be put out. I can't make those words sound gentler, and I'm not sure I should try. Because they serve to remind us 
Remind us not that we need to be perfect, but that we do need to be doing the work of God. That we do indeed need to be doing the work God calls us to and doing our best, because when it comes down to it, we will indeed, whether I preach on it all the time or only on Advent, we will indeed face judgment for how we have shown out the fruit that Christ calls us to. How we have loved, how we have shown grace, how we have worked for justice and cared for others. John the Baptist reminds us that there is at the end a judgment where God will want us to give an account of how we have done these things. I don't know what that judgment looks like, and I frankly have no desire to try. But this text and others like it remind us that God is not messing around. We had best be doing the work God gives us to do. We have our parts to play, and God expects us, frankly, that we will do them to the best of our ability. For the act is already ready to lay bare the stumps of those who don't. And yet, and yet I'm not comfortable leaving it there. I don't believe God is either. I don't think our text this morning compel us to leave it there. I do not believe, as I said, that judgment defines who God is. And that's why I'm fascinated that this sermon by John the Baptist is paired in the lectionary with the text from Isaiah. The text from Isaiah that says that even in the middle of a bunch of stumps, God can find and give grace. It's a wonderful parent, truth be told. You have John, who imagines an axe already there, ready to make stumps of those who fail to live up to God's expectations. And then you have Isaiah, who says, yes, but even from stumps can grow shoots of new life. Even from stumps can grow spirit-infused gifts that show that even judgment not the last word of God. Isaiah was writing to a people who indeed felt judged. Scholars always think this text was written either after the Assyrians had destroyed the northern kingdom or after the Babylonians had first conquered the southern kingdom and began the time of exile. Either way, this text, these words are written after a great military defeat when the people of God are wondering if they were anything but stumps after the judgment of God. And Isaiah gives them hope. Isaiah, who himself had offered judgment, who had said, if you don't straighten up, God will judge and this will happen, says after it happens that there is still hope. Interestingly, he doesn't attempt to deny the situation. Yes, Isaiah says, there are a bunch of stumps here, and yes, even the government feels cut off. That would be Jesse and David, by the way. But, Isaiah says, a shoot will grow from the stump of Jesse, a branch will sprout from his roots, the Lord's spirit will rest upon him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of planning and strength, a spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. New hope, Isaiah says. Hope even when they, when we, feel like stumps. A promise given by God that even stumphood is not the end. That the judgment that comes to Israel, the judgment that might sometimes come to us, it's only a stepping stone away from God's new life. But there is new hope in the midst of that time. 
And note that this new hope that Isaiah promises offers the same vision that John imagines and Jesus preaches. Because the shoot that arises from the stump of Jesse does the justice work of God, judges the poor justly, decides equity for the meek. The weak are protected, and those who serve the ways of violence are stopped. There is a new ruler that comes out of the stumphood of Israel who does what the old regime could not, that enacts the ways of God, the ways of justice and righteousness and shalom, and gives hope to all of those who feel like stumps. In Isaiah's day, in John's day, and in our own. It is a new shoot that says that judgment is not the end, but that the God of grace and mercy and forgiveness will keep doing that grace and mercy and forgiveness thing always. Give us always yet another chance to live in the ways of God. It reminds me of an orange tree that a colleague shared about this past week. Obviously not one of my Iowa colleagues. When she started her current call 12 years ago, there was a place in the yard where there had been a tree, and there was a stump. And so they, they got rid of the stump, and they planted an orange tree, hoping to get fruit and oranges and beauty. But there was too much there. Too many root systems still under the stump area. Too much dead space, and the orange tree tripled and died. And because life is busy for all of us, they never quite got around to going to take an orange tree out. And that dead orange tree just sat there. And sat there. And then it grew. It somehow found a way in the midst of its stumphood.